when we have a society where some people are benefiting disproportionately because money printing meets the needs of some but not others, we start seeing wealth inequality. And when we look at uh, the last example, when people are no longer able to get by, when people are struggling because the cost of living is rising so quickly, why is that happening? Well, our money is worth less over time, so people are incentivized to kind of chuck it into investments in order to kind of escape inflation. And so house prices start skyrocketing, cost of living starts skyrocketing. And so you can start to realize there's a, there's a phrase I use in the book a lot, and that phrase is everything is downstream of money. When you start tinkering with the money, it starts to impact all of these other areas. And so that may give a little bit of a background as to kind of who I am and how my personal experiences have shaped how I see money. I feel really lucky that I'm not an economist. I didn't go and study finance or get an MBA because I think that I've been able to look at the world as it is, as opposed to someone telling me how the world works. And that's kind of, I hope, allowed me to remove some of those filters. And that's what I've tried to talk about in the book a lot. Seb Bunny, how are you doing, man? Oh. I'm doing amazing. Honestly, I've, I've said this a couple of times, but um, I feel like the Bitcoin community is one of the coolest communities. I, I, I stood back for many years watching it and I never really kind of got in with the action. I just kind of like watched this uh, community unfold. And so to be involved in the community and to be able to kind of share your thoughts and just to see how open people are, it's just an incredible community. So I, I truly appreciate you having me on. Yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, congratulations to your book. I read it twice. I'm, I'm reading it now for the third time because it's so it's first of all, it's not that, you know, it usually I, I you know, I, I make a I have, you know, I, I have an overview, you know, I read it like fast read it and then I read it like in detail, you know, so I get because I'm like more like a, you know, 30,000, whatever, what do we call it, feet or meter <laughs> bird view and then going into details. This is how I read books. But uh, you've done an amazing, you know, gorgeous job. I mean, uh, the language you're using, the the formulation, the syntax. I mean, everything is just perfect, and and you've really hit it, hit everything on nail. I mean, uh, every you know misconceptions people have, fallacies in thinking, biases. Um, so yeah. So anyway, before I go on a rant, <laughs> first of all. Congratulations, Seb. It's it's a great book. I would even give it if I had a a kid that at least you know it would. I, we have a daughter like three years old, but I would definitely give her a book if she's like a little bit older, like seven, eight, ten years. I don't know. Uh, maybe there maybe there's a critical age you could give it to for the comprehension process. But you know, if you're curious, if you're open minded, read it. The hidden it's cost. Definitely, <laughs> you know what. When, when I initially set out to write this, and I should say, I'll take a step back for a second. Like my background, if you start reading the book, and obviously, as you know, is a, as a man and bike instructor. And I like trying to distill things down into their simplest form. And I find there's so many books. If you want to go deep into the philosophy of money, you can go into Breed Love. If you want to go into the technicality of, say, Bitcoin, you can go Antonopoulos, or you can go into Michael Saylor for corporations. But what I found was missing was something that distilled things down for the layperson, for the average individual who's just working and doesn't quite understand why is my cost of living constantly rising? Why is it harder for me to be able to spend time with my kids because I'm constantly having to work more? All of these kind of questions that kind of come to the average person. So I really tried to just kind of explain it more in conversational tone for the average individual because I felt as if there was a book missing and that was the book. And so that was my intention is to try and make it as easily digestible as possible because there's not enough content like that. Okay. Um, yeah, I totally understand that, uh, uh, what you're saying. Um, one thing uh, before I, uh, I just, I just popped in my mind because, uh, there's something in your book, uh, the, this part where you, um, explain a little bit about your upbringing, you know, how you grew up. And I found it really touching because it, it shows a lot of, uh, not only of course emotions, but, but it shows the motivation, the, the root, you know, of, of mm -hmm. your, of your development, of your mental, psychological, intellectual, cognitive, spiritual, maybe even, you know, development. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. I mean, uh, because, you know, uh, before we go, you know, talk about, you know, the essence of money and the essence of Bitcoin, um, what, what is it that you, you know, um, what was the pain point maybe in your life where you said, okay, this, uh, that also, you know, introduced yourself, you know, uh, to the path, to the journey of, Mm -hmm. of understanding, comprehending the essence of money and, and eventually Bitcoin. For sure. So I would say, well, very early on, 
we are a product of our environment naturally. And there's kind of three main kind of stories that I touch on in the book, and there's many others. But in general, these three main stories kind of help. They're pivotal in me kind of understanding that something may be wrong. And so the first one, and I should also quickly just preface that by saying this wasn't in the moment because some of them, have, when, when I'm very young, it's more looking back on these things. And in reflection, you start to realize, huh, I didn't realize how money kind of wove into this area and started actually impacting how I interact with others or how I impact uh, my job and whatnot. So the first one was my parents separated when I was around uh, five years old and we moved back and forth across the world twice. And what I really came to realize is that my mum had to work full time to be able to support us and put a roof over myself and my two brothers' heads and to be able to kind of put food on the table. And because she was having to work, work, work to be able to support us, what you start to realize is that I may have not had, um, to be honest, I didn't necessarily feel like I had my emotional needs met as a child. And that's no fault of my mum. That's She had to work to be able to support us um, and, and, and feed us. But that meant that the money, because she had to work, she wasn't able to meet our emotional needs, which meant I looked at my peers a lot. But when you're growing with your peers, you're not necessarily, you're exploring the world together. So you don't have that like kind of moral compass from which to ground with, which is your parents or your elders. And so I had a lot of questions when I was growing up as to like, who am I? Like, what is what are my needs? Because at the moment I'm trying to fit in. I'm, tr I'm not necessarily trying to figure out who I am. I'm simply trying to fit in, trying to get along, trying to build friends. And then that kind of led me to a second point, which is when I was about nine years old, I remember, and I, I talk about this kind of later in the book, I remember saving up for the scooter. There was a scooter that I wanted in this toy store so badly. And I was saving up for the scooter. I finally had the money. It took me about three months. We walk into the toy store with my dad. And my dad is like, ah, you know what? I feel bad that you're getting the scooter and uh, your brothers aren't getting the scooter. So I'm going to pay for the scooter for your brothers and you can pay for the one for yourself. And I'd save for like three months of the scooter. So I was, as a kid, I was devastated. I was absolutely devastated. And what I realized looking back is in money, in macroeconomics, there's something called the Cantillon effect. And the Cantillon effect is those closest to the monetary spigot benefit disproportionately. And this is kind of the, uh, the Cantillon effect on a microcosm and on a, micro, on a micro level, which is my brothers were much closer to my, my dad. And so my dad used to support them a lot more financially. And now as an adult, I see my brothers, they're a lot more socialist leaning. They're a lot more intervention hands out, where, uh, handouts, whereas I would say I'm the reverse, which is very free market and competition because I want the value to rise to the top. But you can already start to see how these little mini events start shaping us. And then the final one, which I kind of touch on in the book, is... For over a decade, I was a mountain bike instructor, and I absolutely loved it. And going growing up through kind of my early teens, I used to watch every single mountain bike film that used to come out. Like all of the the idols used to be in there. I used to have the posters up on my wall, you name it. And I remember when I started working as a mountain bike instructor, I started to work with these people that I idolized as a child. And you start to realize they're just normal people. But not only that, these people that are supposedly world-class athletes are struggling. They're struggling to be able to afford rent. They've got credit card debt. They're struggling to get by. And you're just like, how can someone who is at the top of their game globally, that they're in all of the biggest movies, they're getting millions of people watching them from around the world, struggle to get by. And so I started looking inwards and I realized I have to do something about this if I want to live my best life or pursue the things that I enjoy. And that's when I started looking into investing. And of course, when you go into investing, you start looking into money. When you start looking into money, you start looking at the monetary system. And that's when I started realizing, huh, I think all of these things have one thing in common, and that is our monetary system. Whereas when my mom is unable to continue to be able to support our emotional needs because she has to work, it's our monetary system when our money is losing value. When we look at, say, even like my dad on a microcosm level, when we have a society where some people are benefiting disproportionately because money printing meets the needs of some but not others, we start seeing wealth inequality. And when we look at uh, the last example, when people are no longer able to get by, when people are struggling because the cost of living is rising so quickly, why is that happening? Well, our money is worth less over time. So people are incentivized to kind of chuck it into investments in order to kind of escape inflation. And so house prices start skyrocketing, cost of living starts skyrocketing. And so you can start to realize there's a, there's a phrase I use in the book a lot. And that phrase is everything is downstream of money. When you start tinkering with the money, it starts to impact all of these other areas. And so that may give a little bit of a background as to kind of who I am and how my personal experiences have shaped how I see money. Because, and, I, and the last point I'll say is, I feel really lucky that 
I am not an economist. I didn't go and study finance or get an MBA because I think that I've been able to look at the world as it is, as opposed to someone telling me how the world works. And that's kind of, I hope, allowed me to remove some of those filters. And that's what I've tried to talk about in the book a lot. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's fascinating. Uh, your background and your story. Uh, that's why I wanted you, you know, in your own words to uh, elaborate a little bit on this, because I think it's really, it touches uh, on, on, on many levels. Uh, and and uh, the perils, you know, that I also see, because you talked about like, you know, separation or, or divorce, you know, of your parents, because my, my parents had uh, divorced uh, approximately at, at that age when I was like four mm -hmm. or five. So, uh, <laughs> so we have a lot of, uh, what do you call it, like perils of common ground here. Um, so, Seb, uh, yeah, you talked about the cantillion effect. Um, do you think we are at the peak of like or um, of pain point? Like, uh, what I find interesting is that uh, I mean, I have my suspicion about Milai. You know, Javier Milai. Uh, what mm -hmm, do you, mm -hmm. How do you pronounce his name? You know, the president. I mean, uh, I find it still amazing that he won, but I still have somehow my suspicion bringing in. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to go into all these, uh, yeah, um, points because. Um, yeah. Anyway, but one point is definitely uh, valid is that he's he brought in some ex uh, I don't know it, was it like ex J P Morgan mm -hmm. bankers or Goldman mm -hmm. Sachs like central bank or something like that. I, I want to have your thought on that too. But what I find interesting is that he he for the first time I mean for the first time but on a, on a mainstream level he he started talking explaining the Cantillon effect on a TV show. Did you did you get that? Like uh, no, you have to uh, read uh, the English subtext or maybe it was translated in mm -hmm. synch synchronicity. But uh, I find it interesting that for the first time, you know, uh, you know, a, a huge number of people are exposed to the definition and comprehension of what is the fucking Cantillion effect, you know. <laughs> so I, I um, applaud, you know, that that you are also, you know, like uh, explaining this so thoroughly in your book, you know, and what ramifications, what consequences out of this, you know, and what I find, you know, sad and tragic is that people. And this is this is the sub you know substantive problem we have with people or our environment, whether it be friends, family, you know, colleagues, use, neighbors, or you know, the environment we're dealing with is mm -hmm. people, the masses are so or have been so, including myself and everybody. But you know, someday we woke up, you know, through different rabbit holes, dumbed down, uh, you know, indoctrinated brainwashed uh you know uh, uh put programmed you know with fear and i think these are let's say uh, layers of layers of reasons why people cannot wake up or mm -hmm. and then they don't have the time you know to do their own research they are bombarded with this stupid you know uh mainstream propaganda lies fabrication so yeah this is this is what i mean you know you're giving with this book i think a really thorough you know uh emotionally touching but very very uh, comprehensive, you know, factual, evidence-based picture, uh, which mm -hmm. I'm, you know, sometimes I'm having a hard time, you know, describing, you know, the the comprehension process of people. It's like a psychedelic process, you know. You cannot, uh, you know, translate it into words, but you know exactly what I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, a great work. Seriously. Well, and it's it's interesting because you bring up some really good points. And the first one is, I think that our system, intentional or not, and it's tough to be able to tell, our system because we are seeing inflation, increasing inflation, where our cost of living is rising, which means it's extracting more and more of our time. What that means is we don't have as, enough, um, as much time to be able to actually assess the content we're consuming. So it's far easier to fall into these controlling traps where we've got an authoritarian, totalitarian government. And an interesting point that I mentioned very briefly, but actually I think it's a really profound point, is this fact that pre-1980s, if you'd looked up the definition of inflation in the, in the dictionary, it would have said inflation is a rise in prices as a result of an expansion of the monetary supply. What's interesting is post 19, uh, 1980s, they changed, the government changed the definition and the definition went to inflation is a rise in prices. And the reason why they did that is because Biden or whoever can stand up in front of the, its populace and say, our biggest threat is inflation. We need to fight inflation as if inflation is this beast that we need to slay. But the reality is, if you want to stop inflation, you just simply stop printing money. And so I think it's really important to mention that because I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize uh, to your kind of early point, there's so many things, whether it's the Cantillon effect, whether it's inflation, people just think money is this beast that they're trying to tame, but they are the money. 
they're controlling the money. It's not this beast we have to tame. If we want a more fair system, we can create a more fair system overnight. And I think it's 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 crucial for people to understand kind of just the ins and outs of how our monetary system works, because I think it would change how we perceive the world around us. And that's where even just with the book, I, I, I don't think when it comes to, say, something like Bitcoin, I don't think we can actually understand the benefits of Bitcoin and the solutions that Bitcoin is offering until you actually understand What's wrong with our current monetary system? I thought it was great. You get ease of use. You get transactions when you want. Banking is essentially free in most countries. And it's just like, oh, well, I would say most of those are actually problems, not benefits. Exactly. And, you know, you, I mean, I find it great that you also referenced, you know, some of my you know, also favored uh, authors, uh, such as Safina Moose, I think, Jeff Booth. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of him because, I mean, he's such a system critical thinker, Jeff Booth. He just sees... And understand comprehend you know the much much bigger picture and the like like zoom out and understand you know you are within the system you're still thinking and comprehending things and analyzing things within the system mm -hmm. and i think more and more people and experts macro experts are, are you know are also uh i think uh in their interviews in their explanations also you know emphasizing this fact you know i think one of them is preston pishin recently but uh what do you think about i mean or how would you explain to to my, you know, to my, to, to my audience or to anybody, like, wh wh why is the power of a deflationary money uh, such, I mean, Bitcoin with, with this mm -hmm. absolute scarcity and, and immutability and all the, I mean, monetary properties that we could have ever dreamt of for the first time in human history. Why, first of all, I mean, it's important to understand the problems, the cause, you know, and the consequences and, you know, how we've been suffering as humanity without actually knowing it, you know, all, mm -hmm. everything that's been stolen from us, not only monetarily, but especially what I love is the technological aspects and not just, you know, this whole AI digital, but I'm like talk, talking and I, I've talked a lot about, about these issues with, with, with Jeff Booth, you know, I'm like, you know, how much have we, you know, been stolen from, you know, energy, mm -hmm. transportation, propulsion system, uh, healing. I mean, at least in that last hundreds of years. Um, and then, and then go into the other extremes, like what kind of potential does humanity have? I mean, uh, it's like, you know, people do not, uh, as if people think maybe they haven't, des sometimes I'm really thinking, have, do people think they don't deserve maybe a much, much better life, you know, mm -hmm. work less, but then do the things they really love to, uh, they're chosen to do, or it's maybe in the mission to do things. And maybe finally, you know, we, we can work, you know, uh, totally voluntarily with passion and love, maybe five, 10 15 hours per week and the rest of the time we you know we do things we we bring ourselves into society into civilization and this is how we thrive how we prosper do you know where i'm going with this <laughs> <laughs> no and what i think is fascinating is the analogy that kind of comes to mind actually and i've never really thought about this is you can think about it even just as in our diets so many people get so used to eating processed food processed food like food that is i would say far less food and more just chemicals and toxins and so because it's a slow incremental increase in our diet we don't really notice how it's making us feel and so we can't imagine when we see others who are kind of bounding around doing exercise spending time in the mountains they feel like they can swim forever run forever you name it you're just like, oh, that's just an anomaly. And you just kind of, you don't even question it. And I think that until you actually step back and you change the whole system of how you're eating and you go back to maybe a more ancestral diet where we're eating more head and nose to tail animal products and more homegrown organic food, you start to realize actually, oh my God, I can live a far better life where I feel far healthier, I have far more energy that actually supports me. And so the same thing is true for our monetary system. And I think first, uh, going back to kind of the point that we're making, which is you kind of got to understand the present system to understand Bitcoin. It, I think it will make sense to discuss, there's a chapter in the book, which I call chapter, it's chapter three, and I, I, and I call it the four stages of economic ruin. And this will help us understand why intervention is not the answer and why we face a lot of the issues we're facing. And then I'll bring it back to Bitcoin. So you, the first stage, well, I'll mention the four stages first, and then we'll dive into them. There's something called a misalignment to reality. Then we've got the death of creative destruction. Then we've got capital flow distortion and then decision-making impairment. Now, these four stages are why intervention does not work. So the first one, misalignment to reality. The reality is that if you think about it, technology is always trying to get more for less. And this is something that Jeff has talked about extensively in his book, The Price of Tomorrow. Technology is always trying to get more for less. And the analogy I was just thinking about in the shower was you think about even just like books, 
pre the gut uh, the Gutenberg printing press in nine uh, when was it was at 1436 or something like that we had to hand write books and all of a sudden when a printing press came about we could start manufacturing books on mass production it became exponentially cheaper to print books and then today you've got things like KDP Kindle uh, Direct Publishing and you can do uh, print on demand someone can order one book from Amazon and they'll print one book and send it out and you're competing on price with some of the biggest publishers in the world so you can start to see how Technology as it advances is always trying to get more for less. So it's driving down prices. But then why are we not experiencing prices going down? And that brings us to the next stage, the death of creative destruction. Now, if you think about a business, a business in our current world is always trying to grow, grow, grow. So it starts taking on debt to be able to fund operations. As it starts taking on debt to be able to fund operations, if prices were falling in the long term, then that means its margins should slowly be squeezed over time. That means its profit should be reducing over time uh, unless it is growing. And so all of a sudden, if you've taken on debt, it's very easy when prices are falling for your debt to become overly burdensome and for you to collapse. So then what does the government do? The government steps in. The government steps in and starts intervening by printing and injecting capital into society. And by doing that, it starts supporting up these businesses that otherwise would have failed. The businesses that are not actually offering value in society. Because if you're not offering value in society, if you're not able to fund your expenses uh, because you're either not offering a product that people want or you're being fiscally irresponsible and taking on too much debt, then naturally in a free market, you would wither away and someone who is offering value would rise up. But that doesn't happen. Instead, the government bails you out. So now all of these businesses that actually are offering value now have to consume capital that otherwise would have gone to research and development and innovation to then spend that on competition. And so you're actually destroying capital and you're preventing creative destruction from taking hold. You're not allowing value to rise up because you're supporting businesses that are actually failing. That leads us to the third stage, capital flow distortion. If people naturally in a free market, they spend money where value is being created, then naturally capital is always going and flowing towards where value is being created in society. On the flip side, if we're supporting all these businesses that should not be alive, then all of a sudden we're seeing a bunch of capital propping up businesses that are not actually offering value to society, that are not being fiscally responsible. And we're seeing this over and over and over again. In 2008, in 2020, we've seen it in about many of these kind of depressions, recessions. The government is stepping in, bailing out companies that have proven that they've not been able to manage their balance sheets. And so this leads us to the fourth stage, which is decision-making impairment, which is if we don't know what a free and unimpeded market deems as valuable, if we don't know what companies should or should not exist, and if we don't actually know what the actual risks in our economy are because the government continues to step in and intervene, then how can we make decisions that are going to help protect our future, build security, help for prosperity? So ultimately, when we start intervening, we actually start impairing our ability to see the world as it really is. And you can think about it as like, I came across this analogy the other day. It's kind of like when you've got a knock in the car, like you're, you're driving along and there's something knocking or something rattling in your car and you turn up the radio and it's just like, cool. For the meantime, it's disappeared. And then you come across it again. It's a little louder. You turn up the radio. That's all we're doing. Every time we're intervening, we're just turning up the radio and we're masking the symptom in society. And so what is interesting is now let's look at that from a Bitcoin perspective. Now, this misalignment to reality where technology should be driving down prices, if we have a fixed amount of units. So if we've got 21 million potential Bitcoin and that is all that there will ever be, then that means that as technology advances, as productivity increases, because you cannot devalue the currency, that means actually costs should fall over time. So if costs are falling over time, then it becomes easier to get by. And the one that actually I think is so, so fascinating is in money, there's something called the three functions of money. That is a store of value, a medium of exchange, a unit of account. Now let's forget about these other two for a second and focus on a store of value. So money, naturally, like a battery, you want it to be able to store your value over time. If you go into the grocery store and you buy three AAA batteries and then you go and store them in the cupboard and then a year later you're like, ah, the TV remote's died, I want to go and use one of those batteries. You don't want that battery to be half empty. That's a, It's annoying. And that's how our money works today. Our money over time, when we go to use it, a year or two later, there's been 15, 20% inflation. We've lost 20% of the energy of our money. And so with Bitcoin, the opposite is true. Well, oh, sorry. And I should say, when money no longer serves as a store of value, people still want to store that value somewhere, but they're just not going to store it in the money. So what are they going to do? They're going to go and flood into things like real estate. They're going to flood into equities. They're going to flood into bonds, all as a way to protect themselves from inflation. And the problem with that is 
people are no longer using, say, houses for their intended use to put a roof over your head. People are no longer using farmland for its intended use to farm and grow crops. Instead, they're using it as an inflation hedge. So where I live in Whistler, I live in a ski town that is quite a desirable place to live. People come from all over the world to live here. But because property holds its value here and it's a desirable place to live, we've got a lot of investors that come in here and buy up property just as an inflation hedge. And now 61% of houses are empty. And so what this means is if you flip this on its head and you have something like Bitcoin, where all of a sudden our purchasing power mm -hmm. is increasing over time, well, what does that do? Well, real estate has gone up on average around 7 to 8% over the last 100 years annualized. Equities have gone up about like 9 to 10% annualized. Bonds have gone up around 5 to 6% annualized. Well, technology is driving down prices on average by around 5 to 15%. So that means that technology at the high end is outcompeting real estate, equities, and bonds. So that means that all of a sudden, you're actually incentivized to save in the currency because you're actually going to get a better return in the currency than you would do in a lot of these traditional assets. So all of this money floods back into the currency, which drops the prices of real estate, drops the prices of equities, drops the prices of bonds. And this also means that if real estate and things like farmland are now accessible to the average person because they've lost 90% of their value because capital has flooded back into the currency for saving. Exactly. And that's yeah. supporting the average person. The average person yeah. can now go and purchase a house and put a roof over their head because yeah. the monetary system supports that. So we become and, in alignment with people. And real estate would go finally, you know, to its essential, what do you call it? Utility function, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And then we would have much, first of all, you know, uh, we would have, you know, all these overpopulation, you know, uh, <laughs> what fear mongering, you know, porn mongering uh, of, of, you know, we have too many people. Too many... No, I mean, we have, we could have then, first of all, we, we would uh, real estate, you know, and, and houses, housing would go to its essential utility function. And then we would have more innovative living, you know, housing, uh, heating, and then eventually transportation. So, you know, we could have easily, easily 30 billion people on this planet with no problem whatsoever. You know, mm -hmm. and people would thrive and prosper and nurture themselves with super organic food and, and everything else. But I'm just no, I, I, <laughs> no and I, I, could, I could not agree more. And, and this is where I think like more than anything, we're seeing so much capital destruction from inflation because naturally, if, if I want to be able to direct my capital into the economy where I see fit, but all of a sudden prices are rising by 20, 30% because the government is printing more money and then using that purchasing power to go and fund wars or fund debt or you name it. All of a sudden, I'm no longer being able to express to the world what it is that I deem as valuable. And all my purchasing power is just being directed by the government or the banks. And so I think it is so important that we move back to a monetary system that actually supports the people because we're slowly having the life sucked out of us, the soul sucked out of us. And this is where it kind of gets a little more spiritual. Um, people invest in Bitcoin because of its speculative nature. But I would say Bitcoin for the first time in history is a monetary system that actually allows us to slowly express our true values. So it actually brings ourselves back into our authentic self. It allows us to have more time over time so that actually we have we have a better capacity to look inwards and to actually understand who am I? What is it that actually my purpose is? How can I add value to society? And so I would say that people say, well, there's a lot of kind of this belief that we need inflation because we need to force people to spend because we need to continue growth. And it's just like, mm, I would say that if we had, if we actually reduced, say, GDP growth and actually allowed money to store value over time, it would have people thinking a lot more, which means people would actually direct capital to more viable forms of technology as opposed to just directing capital simply to try and escape inflation, which is creating a lot of destruction. Daniel Prince is a you know, good friend of ours, both of us. So uh, he, I know he wrote a beautiful foreword for your book, and you know, and he's he's like super. I mean, I love him because he's he's not only you know super intelligent and 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 and, and you know and wise and you know with all his kids and 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 of course he's homeschooling uh, <laughs> uh, crusade. You know, so I'm a huge fan of homeschooling, and I, I was just thinking, God, you know, once we finally reach that point because we are already thinking ahead you know like what are we going to do with our daughter you know because they're not so much mm -hmm. offering we live like don't live like we live on top of the mountain somewhere here and in, in austria and uh there are not so many offers or or uh or alternative you know options uh i mean there mm -hmm. are but then much further away but that would be you know great if uh more people or people who who have the resources and 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 the energy and the capacities and the brains you know to get them together 
and uh, you know and start homeschooling on on all you know different levels will it be practical you know things to build or technology or science or mm -hmm. and this is you know how we generation wise you know can catapult ourselves uh, into really an evolutionary uh, civilization uh, so that would be, uh, I mean, for uh, for people. I and mean, do you have kids? I, I guess not. Or, or do you? No. I, I, you know what? I for for a while <laughs> I was with a partner who had a kid, and so I've spent a lot of time uh, parenting. I'm not a parent, and I would I would love to be. I cannot wait to have kids. And I've also worked a lot in the school district, so I've seen oh, uh, yeah. through the school district. I work a lot with uh, kids with developmental disorders, kids with learning dis uh, um, disabilities, and it's just phenomenal to see people expand out of themselves and what i really realized and this is more of a personal story that i didn't talk about too much in the book but i dropped out of school when i was 14 years old because mm. i genuinely thought i was thick i didn't fit in i didn't know what i was doing and what i've come to realize in my later teens is actually school just wasn't stimulating me school was not meeting any of my needs i was stuck in this room and i was i was diagnosed with adhd as a kid i was stuck in this room with 30 other kids being told what to do and not allowing any freedom to be able to explore what actually interested me and so when i kind of left school and went to pursue mountain biking and moved out to canada and then all of a sudden I'm this mountain bike instructor that could read and pursue whatever content i wanted that's when all of a sudden my gears started turning and i started looking at the world differently and i started to realize that so many of these kids her not having their needs met. There's a famous quote, which is like, genius is not created, but it's destroyed. And it's kind of, we all have a genius inside of us, but many times it's suppressed. It's suppressed because our system doesn't actually support it. And I feel really lucky to have actually kind of not gone down the traditional route and to be able to pursue the things that I enjoy because it actually allowed me to direct my energy from an early age into something I was passionate about. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think from working in the school district, you see these kids, there's no wonder these kids have so-called ADHD, which I think is just basically, they've just got a ton of energy because they're, they're not having an outlet. They've got no outlet to be able to direct their energy towards. But you're just seeing these kids that are not having their needs met. They're not having their passions stimulated. And they don't know who they are because they're not having their needs met. And they're not able to go down these avenues, which which may interest them. So I, I do truly believe that if we had a monetary system that supported the needs of the people, that actually had, uh, a over time, our cost of living went down as opposed to up, then parents would have more time. And if parents have more time, then they can actually start to uh, be kind of stoke the fire of inquisitiveness with their kids and try to find out what it is that they're interested in and help them pursue those things. Because for me, it is so sad when we see all of these kids day in, day out coming into these schools globally. And of course, they're learning something, but I don't think that it is creating an innovative um, an innovative uh, society that actually meets the needs of the populace. Instead, as we know, it's a Victorian labor workforce kind of producer. It is from the 14th, 15th century onwards, we needed to create labor workforce in order to be able to propel society forwards. And that's what the educational system was initially built on. Exactly, yeah. And you know, I mean, uh, it is, I mean, it makes me happy that more and more parents, uh, not enough, but more and more parents are w waking up uh, you know, whatever topic it is, would it be vaccines? I'm a total anti-vax. I mean, we are total mm -hmm. anti-vaxxers. I mean, you know, the people are like starting, you know, this discussion like, oh, you know, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but, you know, but, you know, we are, anti I mean, the, 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 the overwhelming evidence now, you know, and the facts mm -hmm. and that have come to the surface now, all the studies, you know, everything that's just a testimonial insider whistleblower studies, it just, uh, it doesn't matter what, but people, I think, are waking up, especially parents and they're, um, because, you know, we went, I went to a sort of called, you know, elite school and, you know, decades later, like waking mm -hmm. up and especially after watching this documentary, I think it was in the Austrian producer or, or, uh, um, uh, filmmaker, uh, it's called alphabet. And that really woke me up, uh, the difference between system indoctrinated, uh, students, you know, because the mm -hmm. system does not want you to question anything, right? Mm -hmm. It just says, you know, this is an electron and, you know, shut up and 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 sit down and just regurgitate everything, mm -hmm. you know, what we tell you to. So we never learn to question anything, you know, talking about money, right? I mean, <laughs> right? Whether you're going to school or university, we never learned anything about mm -hmm. money. The essence of money, I mean, it's so simple to understand, but, but now finally, I mean, it's overdue. And I think, to be honest with you, I think the clock is ticking and we need as a community or as an individual, first of all, but as a whatever you call it, uh, like uh, awakened community or a Bitcoin community, we really mm -hmm. somehow to to accelerate this this process. 
Mm-hmm. Um, for no, reasons I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go into. More. But I have my, you know, uh, my understanding now. I have a lot of knowledge. But but it's 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 so important that people wake up and and you know and with the help you know of of you and your books and others you know and Daniel Prince and he you know all these people are like you know guys you know wake up and it's so it's so it's so difficult and it's so frustrating because you know you have family <laughs> right and everybody can tell a story about this you know you have friends and family. And they're like 95, 99%, you can't talk to these people. It's mm-hmm. I mean, You don't know how what to talk about. And if you talked about it, you have to, you know, put on like silk gloves and maybe, you know, plant a seed and maybe a year or two years later, unfortunately, by that time, a lot of things, you know, whether it be the fucking vaccines or mRNA, you know, I'm like, we told you so, but we don't want to tell you that we told you so, mm-hmm. right? So... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going on a rant here, but but uh, it's it's uh, this is what we are dealing with. We are dealing with a huge, I mean, uh, problem of of I don't know cognitive dissonance, rationalization, brainwashing, mm-hmm. and programming, and and then you've got this ex- so many exogenous factors, right? <laughs> you've got the geopolitics, macroeconomics, uh, false flags, uh, the pedophilia system. I mean, uh, it's it's mind blowing. But people, mm-hmm. I think, uh, cannot be maybe. Maybe even uh, open up because it would just it would just uh, it would just um, you know make their belief system like you know fall uh, like a house of cards and crumble down you know and I think a lot of people maybe are afraid of that. What do you think? I mean, like zooming out, like what is the process? Also, I'm just going to shut up now. But but what what do you think is the process, the the evolving process within the next months and years? Because I think it will accelerate. And I'm not the only one, as you know, mm-hmm. but 24, 25, I think will be fucking crazy years in maybe even more positive terms than in negative. So you bring up such a good point, which is the fact that I think the world today, because we're having our time constantly encroached upon, we constantly have to work more just to be able to get by. We have very little time to be able to think for ourselves and to be able to question the content of which we're consuming. And because of that, I I think the world likes to see things as black and white. You're either with Ukraine or you're with Russia, or you're either with Palestine or you're with uh, Israel, or you're either pro-vaccine or you're against vaccines. And the reality is, the world is very, it's, it's gray. It's not black or white. Things are not just one side or the other side. And you can even see this in politics. Like uh, we no longer have many bipartisan bills and, and leaders and or we're having people like Robert Kennedy Jr. who's running as an independent. Instead, it's just like you're either red or you're blue. You're either labor, labor or conservative or Republican, Democrat. And it, everyone is so segmented because they're each telling their story and they're just like, you're either with us or you're not. And the reality is that I don't know. I, I tend to believe that everyone has their own opinions. And if you believe in free speech, I believe that everyone should be able to voice those opinions, regardless of whether or not you agree with those opinions. And that's where what I find really challenging to visualize is that at the moment, it doesn't actually matter if you're voting for the left or voting for the right, voting for the Republicans or the Democrats, because when we have a debt based system, no matter who you vote for, they're going to have to continually intervene because otherwise the debt is going to overwhelm the economy and you're going to have a major deflationary shock, collapse, depression, you name it. And so what is really challenging right now is socialism begets socialism. And that's why over time, no matter who you're voting for, it's slowly leaning further and further and further left. And we're seeing more and more and more intervention. And it'll be interesting to see Malay in Argentina because when you transition from a socialist system into a more free market system, the first thing that happens is because we've been living so far beyond our means for so long and we've taken so much debt to be able to do that, you've now got to live within your means to pay back that debt or experience this major period of kind of austerity. And people think that, well, if we're if life is tough, this is because it doesn't work. Free markets doesn't work. And it's just like, mm, I would say that actually that is the symptom of a broken socialist system. It's kind of like if you started getting an inkling of a sore stomach and then you let it go and go and go and go and then a few years down the line, now you have cancer. The the difference in being able to move from a sore stomach back to normal versus move from cancer back to normal is a lot of change, a lot of pain to be able to move back to normal. And that's the same thing. We've, we've now got to move from a system, a socialist system, back to a more free market system, which is going to mean we're going to have to live within our means. And so I think this transition period is going to be a challenging one because I don't see many governments or nations stepping up and actually saying the problem is that we are intervening. We need to stop intervening. 
And that's where I wonder if something like Bitcoin, for the first time in history, is actually agnostic of government. It doesn't matter who the government is. And if we get more and more support for something like Bitcoin, it actually forces the government's hand. Because at the moment, if you've got a monetary system, which the government continue to print, print, print and debase the currency, eventually, if you've got this alternate monetary system where people's cost of living is declining, where prices are actually uh, they're falling in the long run, then people are going to start transitioning to this other monetary system. And if they're transitioning to this other monetary system and capital is flowing towards Bitcoin, then all of a sudden these guys are not going to be in able to intervene at the same rate they have been intervening without seeing hyperinflation. And so... The only way for them to be able to capture purchasing power from Bitcoin is to start offering value. And the only way to offer value is to be able to actually listen to the populace. And so you start to realign the incentives in society if we have a monetary system that actually meets the needs of the people. And so this is where I see Bitcoin as kind of a ground up way to change the system, as opposed to a top down way of trying to get a politician in power who's going to change the rules and the regulations to be able to be in favor of you. Because the challenge is, it doesn't actually matter. Let's just say Hypothetically, we had someone like Robert Kennedy Jr., who I think would be a phenomenal president, step in and say, we want Bitcoin to partially back the central bank. We want to kind of put in much heavier mandates on um, or heavier regulation on, say, vaccines or something like that. And I, I think that in this situation, all of a sudden we could have a few prosperous years. But all you need is one left-leaning government to step in and all that's gone again. And so it doesn't really matter who the politician is. That's where I think it's really important to be able to actually build out a system that supports the individual and then actually creates the incentives for the politicians to act on behalf of the populace, not the other way around. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Totally with you on that. Um, now you mentioned uh, Mila again, Argentina. I mean, uh, do you see, I mean, next uh, after El Salvador, do you see like um, a sort of a chain reaction? Um uh, at least i don't know maybe in latin america south mm -hmm. america or africa like once you know a critical number of smaller countries like el salvador um uh, you know adopt or uh, hyper bitcoinize or go on a bitcoin standard or uh i mean let's see let's see what Mila really is is made of but mm -hmm. do you see that coming and and with all the other you know do you see like a a, a wave of of Maybe even, I mean, you know, I'm not a fan of this institutional adoption per se, but but it it does, you know, bring people. Uh, first of all, it makes it mainstream. It uh, mm -hmm. uh, exposes people, uh, you know, group, uh, boomers <laughs> uh, to to Bitcoin in one way. I mean, not your keys, not your coins. We get that right, but um, and there's so many. Maybe I mean, do you have like an opinion or maybe a better analysis? Like, what is this ETF spot ETF also about? I mean, is this good? Is this bad? Uh, do you think it will eventually, you know, bring in all these hundreds of billions, maybe even trillions within the span of, I don't know, maybe even next uh, one or two years? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two main things you're talking about there. You're talking about kind of adoption on a nation state level, and then you're talking about the ETFs. So the first one, the nation state level, I would say that there's a chart I saw a little while back, which is I think it's um, Samson Mao who is, he's a part of kind of this company, uh, Jan3, and they're at the moment trying to orange pill a lot of these nation states. There are a lot of South American nation states that are incredibly interested in something like Bitcoin. And so I wouldn't be surprised if in the next three, four, five years, we do start to see, I think it's like Mexico, I think they're saying like Ecuador, we've got Argentina, uh, Venezuela, like you name it. And then we've also got countries like Guatemala that have a more open currency system at the moment. So it actually allows for the most uh the money that meets the needs of the people to actually rise up and then you're also seeing it in madeira um and then on top of that when you're looking at countries like el salvador one of the most incredible benefits of uh bitcoin to el salvador is not actually bitcoin the asset which is using it say as a long-term savings vehicle but bitcoin the network and being able to actually just transact on say layer two for a fraction of a cent and this is where i think it's so fascinating so in El Salvador, something like 50% of GDP or gross domestic product and those that are unfamiliar, it's just all the transactions that take place in, in uh, within the nation uh, in any given year, 50% of those transactions are, are what are called remittances. So that is for people that are working abroad and they're sending money back to El Salvador, back to their family. Well, at the moment, when you're sending money back to your family, you have to use big US corporations like Western Union, and the fees on those things are 20, sometimes 30%. It is oh, it is heinous. Yeah, and so if 50% of their GDP comes from transactions that are charging a 20 or 30% fee, that means that overnight they could grow their GDP by 15, 10, 15% just by moving a lot of those fees in-house so it's going back to the families. And so even if you weren't using Bitcoin as a savings vehicle, if you were purely using it just to move US dollars through Lightning, 
to um, El Salvador, then all of a sudden you've just saved your country so much money in fees and, and transactions. And that money is now with the general populace that's so helping raise the quality of life. Now, I see in the future, like um, I also know like Tonga is interested and a lot of the islands, the, especially the Pacific islands that have really high remittance rates, they are perfect candidates for something like Bitcoin, where they can even have their own, their own personal currency or the US dollar alongside Bitcoin. But I think in the long term, as Bitcoin shows its kind of true colors as to how powerful it is and a declining cost of living, I think we're going to see more money flow across into Bitcoin from the traditional currencies. And then kind of to your second point, which is the ETFs. And it's an interesting one. It's really, really tough to kind of map out what is going to happen in the next few years, because I do think that it can go multiple ways. It could go into a way where the majority of Bitcoin is centralized and no longer it's kind of Bitcoin trademark. It's not really... Bitcoin, the sovereignty vehicle that we we currently use. Um, but it could also go the other way. And the way that I'm hoping it goes is that if Bitcoin, all of a sudden we open up Bitcoin to the financial industry and we open up Bitcoin to the general retail individual who otherwise would not have seen it, we're going to see trillions of dollars of capital flood into Bitcoin. Now, if Bitcoin's price starts skyrocketing, people are going to start questioning, why is Bitcoin's price skyrocketing? What is this thing? And then they're going to start doing some research because I would say that nearly every single person outside of, say, the original cryptographers that kind of came into Bitcoin, nearly every single person, including myself, comes into Bitcoin for the speculative. You're just like, hey, I want this asset that can potentially return a decent chunk that maybe can improve my quality of life. So most people are just going to invest in the ETF. They're going to see the ETF start to skyrocket. And then they're going to start questioning, why is it skyrocketing? And then that's when they're going to start looking into our current monetary system. And they're going to start realizing, hey, we've got some issues with our current monetary system. And this is what I'm hoping will happen. And then people are going to start moving capital into ETFs. And I think it is the, um, is it the Fidelity one? One of them allows for withdrawals. Mm -hmm. And if one of them allows for withdrawals and capital is going to start flowing to the one that allows withdrawals, which is going to incentivize the others to allow withdrawals. And then people are going to start moving that capital out of the ETFs and into sovereignty, self-custody, collaborative custody, you name it, that's no longer under control of a centralized entity. But what it's also going to do is... If any of these uh, ETF issuers start taking advantage of their Bitcoin holdings, if they start fractionalizing or start holding cash or you name it, we if we're allowed a bank run, right. it basically just it incentivizes those uh, issuers to hold 100% of their Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Because as we saw with FTX, they, they are supposedly had something like, and I may get the figures wrong, it was something like $1.6 billion of Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And when they actually looked at how much they had, they had 1.1 Bitcoin. They had something like at the time it was like twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin yeah. backing one point six billion dollars of Bitcoin liabilities, and so this is what's going to happen if people start messing around with their balance sheet. If they start saying, "Hey, we've got X amount of Bitcoin," and they don't, and they see a bank run, they're going to quickly go insolvent. So in the end, it actually creates a system whereby they're actually incentivized to not fractionalize their system, not take advantage of their customer, and so I see it in a few different ways playing out. But it's tough to say which way that will be. You you mentioned the, uh, the 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 price you know going maybe might be you know exponentially going up. I mean the thing is that I thought is that um, of course you know we have to think of in terms of uh, purchasing power. Of, uh, but by the time and that could easily happen because there are so many factors and parameters playing simultaneously. You know mm -hmm. internally mm -hmm. whatever geopolitical macro and then lose the loss of the loss of the trust right the mm -hmm. essence what if the trust is like gone you know or the, the accelerated de-dollarization or mm -hmm. and everything you know together you know with maybe false like here uh, war there and then the bricks I, I don't know i'm not uh, i'm not i'm not expert on all these fields but i'm i'm having this notion that or this this suspicion that if everything plays together by the time you know you see that number that price go up to whatever million, ten million. I mean, what's the dollar? What's the euro? What's the fiat going to be worth by then? Mm -hmm. uh, this is my so uh, my thinking. Uh, but uh, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, do you think uh, by the time? I mean, it could easily, it could easily, you know, jump, you know, to hundred thousand and then exponentially faster. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, but with what loss of purchasing power? In euro terms so by that time then finally jeff booth is gonna you know clap his hands and say yo okay now you got it right now you're thinking in the unit of account of bitcoin mm -hmm. right because this is the, the prices are going down for everything right starting from real estate to whatever 
So yeah, this, this is my just two cents. It's, and it's it's so challenging because there's something we always talk about. And if you're in the Bitcoin community, you may have heard of it. There's something called Gresham's Law, which is bad money drives out good. And the premise behind this is that given that any retailer, given that any merchant kind of has to accept, say, the Canadian dollar or the US dollar or the euro because it is legal tender, naturally, people are always going to give up the poorer form of money. So bad money, people start using the bad money and hoarding the good money so that basically the bad money drives out all the good money. And we see this time and time and time again. And this is a result of legal tender laws because legal tender laws mean that the retailer or the merchant has to accept the poorer form of money. And why would I give up gold? Why would I give up Bitcoin? Why would I give up these kind of precious metals if I can give up my dollars, which are basically losing value over time? But what's interesting is what a lot of people don't talk about is there's another law called Thiers law. And Thiers law is in a free market, the inverse is true. If there's no legal tender laws saying the merchant has to accept a certain type of currency, well, naturally, if you're a grocery store, if you're a man and bike cycling shop and you want to kind of uh, receive kind of money from your customers, what are you going to accept? You're not going to accept the poorer form of money because why would you accept a currency that's losing value over time? Exactly. You would request the better form of money. Yeah. And so what I think is interesting is that if we didn't have legal tender laws, I would say that fiat currencies would no way near be in the same position they're in today. The only reason why they're in that position is because they've been forced upon us through the legal system where we have to use them. And so Bitcoin would be a lot further along on its journey if the merchants, if the retailers were able to accept it and people, they, they could refuse Canadian dollars or US dollars. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate and fan of uh, this, uh, what do you call it, uh, circular economies. And, you mm -hmm. know, there are initiatives that are taking place. I think uh, BTC Sessions, Ben, uh, mm -hmm. Tyler, you know, I mean, he's, he started this initiative, which I find just great. And, you know, for example, I mean, uh, around the corner and down there, where we, uh, top of the month, there's, uh, and then down the street, uh, there's a guy uh, who t uh, changes tires, you know, what do you call it? Uh, the, you know, <laughs> and and just by, you know, by, by coincidence, or more, more or less, and we found out that he accepts Bitcoin, you know, and now I, I taught him, you know, how to, you know, download another wallet so he can accept Lightning because he was just, mm -hmm. you know, I accept, you know, he just wanted to, and he, he's, he's actually a, uh, uh, more or less an OG, you know, of a Bitcoin. And so, and, and I want to push that and I want to, you know, um, uh, um, uh, maybe, you know, go to merchants, go to bit smaller, maybe small, mid-sized businesses. And it's like, hey, uh, the the time is it's overdue you know the pain point mm -hmm. is reached people you know you don't need to i mean of course you know if you go to south america to inflation hyperinflationary countries people get it you don't need to explain to them but but now i think people are like ah oh, there's something going on right so mm -hmm. um so um uh, do you think that you know and maybe you know P peter young uh, of of mm -hmm. free private yep, cities, free cities. Yep. Have they renamed it, rebranded it? I think renamed the 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 the, the title "Free Private City." It's, it's it's called something else. Uh, I think it's just called "Free Cities" now. Free cities. I think it's ju oh. just "Free Cities." Yeah, 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 it's great. I met him person. He actually visited us, you know, uh, a couple of years ago. So he stayed at our, at our house. It was just amazing to to have you know deep deep dive talks with him. So I think you know if all these things maybe accelerate and and we have like all these super decentralized circular economies and free cities everywhere. Uh, simultaneously, parallel, you mm -hmm. know, to all the uh, hyper Bitcoinizing, whatever El Salvador's, you know, whether it be in Latin America or uh, in Africa, mm -hmm. I think this is this is this will just catch on as a momentum, and then it will just increase mm -hmm. and, and you know and and and, and then multiply by orders of magnitude. Is well, that something we can see? It's you know what, it's a really tough one because. I was talking to one of my good friends, his name's Scott, and he lives in the interior of BC about five, six hours from me, and I was just spending a bunch of time with him. And he owns a company called Block Rewards, and Block Rewards is all about kind of like benefits and pensions and payments in Bitcoin. So if you were, say, working for a company, you could request they sign up to Block Rewards and they pay a portion of your wage in Bitcoin. Now, what is interesting is that if we are going and using merchants, the challenge that we currently face in most Western nations is that because Bitcoin is deemed property, when you go and purchase something, that's now a taxable event. Mm -hmm. And so if you have purchased Bitcoin, let's just say hypothetically, you purchased it at 10,000 US dollars, and now it's trading at 42,000 US dollars, and you go and purchase a coffee, well, not only do you have to pay for the coffee, but because your Bitcoin has gone up, uh, what is that, like 300%, You've now got to also pay the capital gains tax on uh, if you bought a coffee for four dollars, you've got to pay capital gains tax on three dollars of that four dollars on top of the coffee that you've just paid. Mm -hmm. So it becomes if you're following the system to a T, it becomes prohibitive to actually use Bitcoin day to day with merchants 
because we're not actually incentivized to use Bitcoin. It's not treated as a currency, it's treated as property. And so this is where, when I think about how do we kind of onboard more people? How do we gain more power in the current system? What Block Rewards is doing is fascinating because if employees are going to go to their employer and say, hey, I want to be paid a portion of my wage in Bitcoin, all of a sudden, that employer can simply sign up to something like Block Rewards. It doesn't take a whole new point of sale system, a merchant system to be able to have a front end that may barely get used. But instead, all they have to do is sign up to this system and pay a portion of their employees' wages in Bitcoin. And if this starts catching on, then all of a sudden, you're going to see lots of corporations that are starting to become pro-Bitcoin because their employees wow. are demanding it. And then if those corporations are pro-Bitcoin, they're going to lobby in favor of Bitcoin on a government level. And so this is where I think that, like, let's just say you've got something like Microsoft and you start seeing hundreds, if not thousands of Microsoft employees demanding to be paid a portion of their wage, 5, 10, 15% of oh, Bitcoin. That would, yeah. Microsoft is all of a sudden going to be like, well, right. we have to support our employees. They're going to start becoming much more pro-Bitcoin. We're now going to have lobbying on our side. So I think that you can also see this ground up approach happening through even just requesting employers pay a portion of their wages in Bitcoin. That's just and another so, way that exactly. Scott had opened up. And strengthen yeah. incentives, right? I mean, this yeah. is... You know, and then it's just a self it's, it's a self lobbying mecha mechanism. Wow, mm -hmm. amazing, amazing, phenomenal talk. Uh, I, I wish I could, you know, we could talk for hours. Um, Seb, uh, where can people find you? Uh, again, uh, your book, The Hidden Cost of Money, with the subtitle. Uh, I forgot the subtitle. To be honest. It's like what is it? How financial? Actually, I think I got the book. Wait, no, I don't have the book. Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, how financial fortune, how financial forces shape our lives and the world around us. There, you can okay. see the book right there. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, no, if you if you want to find me, we so about two and a half years ago, three years ago, I co-founded a um, uh, educational platform with Greg Foss and my my business partner Daz Daz B and good. a few others. Yeah. and so we basically our whole goal before I wrote this book is we want to try and make financial literacy, macroeconomics and Bitcoin content accessible and easily understandable for the average person. So the majority of all of our content is free. <clears throat> we have a bunch of free courses that look at macroeconomics, financial literacy, Bitcoin. Uh, so you can find that at lookingglasseducation.com. And then my book is also on that website. We also have another book called Just Beers for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And Beers for Bitcoin is simply, it's kind of looking at Bitcoin, how it works from like a holistic sense. And my business partner, Daz, and I wrote that one. And wow. so it follows along the lines of, uh, if you were to read the two books, The Hidden Cost of Money is more how our monetary system works and the costs of our current monetary system, and then some of the options, which I dive into Bitcoin. And then the next step is kind of beers for Bitcoin. If you're down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin, you're trying to understand it more, you can dive into it there. And then wow. if you find this stuff interesting and you kind of want to follow me directly, you can follow me on Twitter at Seb Bunny, and that's B-U-N-N-E-Y, or just on my website, sebbunny.com, and I kind of post infrequently about blog stuff and things that interest me. But awesome. Again, and like, I remember actually Greg um, mentioning you uh, the first times in his uh, podcast or interviews, uh, you know, about Looking Glass. What was it called? Looking Glass? Yeah. Looking Glass, yeah. A phenomenal project. So I know you're already overloaded with pro, but if you ever, you know, plan to write a children's book, let me know or when it comes out, because that would be, be would be the first thing I would buy, you know, for our, our daughter. So, <laughs> I mean, let's say, because I'm, I'm already reading her, uh, you know, yeah. she, she's uh, uh, she's like three years old, but I'm like, okay, how many Bitcoin are there? Like 21 million. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. That is amazing. One, you've probably, have you met um, Scott and Mallory from Shamari? No, unfortunately not, but I know him on Twitter, yeah. Yeah, you should. They are Scott and Mallory are the most incredible couple, incredible couple. And I've, I, a little while back, one of the down in Vancouver. So I live in Whistler, about two hours from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And one of, there's a guy called Kinetic Finance, and he put together how do we orange pill four year olds. And so we wow. did this little video, and it's on YouTube. I think you can find it if you just type in Kinetic Finance. Okay. And, um, we basically got a bunch of four-year-olds together with their parents and the kids grasp the concept of Bitcoin way quicker than the parents do. And we were reading a bunch of the Shamari books. And so I highly, highly, highly recommend giving Sham Shamari a read because they've got phenomenal kids books. Oh, I got to look them up. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for this. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, Seb, it was a phenomenal talk. Very special. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom and thanks for your work. Congratulations to your book. And uh, yeah, hope we can do this again. Maybe, you know, whatever is a panel discussion or one-to-one uh, -one, or actually I would love to see you one, one day in person, maybe do this interview in person. But, you know, if you're in Austria ever, let me know. <laughs> you're welcome. Oh, 100%. And actually I will be in case you're there, I'll be in Madeira because there's the Madeira conference, the Bitcoin Atlantis. So I'll My be there. 
my wife's uh, brother is going to be there. So yeah. uh, I'm going to let you know. His name is Wolfgang. So uh, yeah. he's going to be there with his family. So uh, yeah, especially because he's doing a master, th something with real estate and Bitcoin deflation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he wants to talk to personally, you know, with Jeff Booth and others. So uh, yeah. I'll let you know or uh, send him my way. You know, you know where to find. Uh, you know, <laughs> that'd be amazing. Well, anyway, I truly, truly appreciate it. Like everything you're doing, the Bitcoin community, as I mentioned at the start, it never ceases to amaze me. And even for just the listeners, like I truly urge each and every one of us has our own perception on how we perceive the world. And so I think it's so important just to share that. And so even with this podcast, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and how you view things as well. Because many times the podcast hosts just ask questions, so it's awesome just to hear your thoughts as well. No, it was super interesting and, and phenomenally inspirational. Well, again, Seb, thank you so much and take care. Hope to see you soon. All right? You too. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.